My dear brothers and sisters, uh, the organizers from Rutgers MSA and guests, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Now come on, the, you, the way you're hitting those balls, that, <laughs> that salam has got to at least be equivalent. <laughs> you sound like you're tired from just hitting a ball. <laughs> uh, my wife um, checks in, you know, periodically throughout the day, and if I get a chance, I text her just telling her how things are going. So they were at a halakha, and so I had not been able to talk to her. So she called right in the middle of all the madness. And I saw like, she's like, where are you? <laughs> I was like, oh, uh, uh, spiritual excellence? <laughs> that doesn't sound like it. Uh, so alhamdulillah that uh, the person envisioned this idea for raising money through that. It gives you guys a, <clears throat> a chance to exercise. But also, uh, it's important for us to think through you know, what our day is like as a college student and inshallah someone aspiring to, to move on to a profession and career. Uh, this month, Rabiul Awal, is the month in which the Blessed Prophet Sallallahu was born. So we talk about spiritual excellence. We really want to hone in on the message that he brought. And if we think about anything in terms of revival, a path to revival, not only at the individual level, at the family collective level, broader society level, and perhaps even at the umatic, you know, the, the 1.5 billion or whatever, and it should be 1.5 billion and one, because my wife and I had a baby in June, <laughs> so my bio is not updated, so it said two sons, alhamdulillah, we have a seven month old daughter, so at least it's 1.5 billion and one, uh, people heading to on this path of revival. And I would say it's a humble uh, suggestion, uh, recommendation that Two things, if we can take from the life of the Prophet wasallam, is our concepts that would help us to achieve this sense of uh, um, revival in a concrete way, would be ihsan, achieving excellence, ihsan in our lives, in everything we do, and ifar. And I'll come back to these both throughout the, the, my, my remarks, and I'll abbreviate them because now, because you played with balls, my lecture is cut short for Maghrib until 5.10, so I'll, I'll cut short some of what I was going to say and then in the evening we have another session to, to give you some open remarks and I'll, I'll elaborate perhaps on that. So, uh, ifar, as I described it, there's not a word, so I use excellence as the closest for Ihsan, but ifar, I, I, I mean by it the, uh, the conscious, intentional uh, uh, desire, uh, uh, preference of others over self. The conscious intentional preference of others over self. And this was throughout the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his companions and all of the scholars, scholars and Muslims who followed them, who followed in that pathway. So the context of why we're talking about spiritual ex excellence, uh, in addition to this being the month of the commemoration of the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but also that in your college days, because this is on a college campus, you're intending and you should be seeking excellence throughout in everything you do. Secondly, I'll address spiritual excellence in, in, in somewhat more depth, learning from the life of the Prophet and also then talk about practicing that in our daily lives and how do we achieve that on the road to revival. Allah SWT says in Surah Ateen, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ التَّقْوِيمِ That indeed we have created man or mankind, if you will, man on in the best of modes, in the best of modes. And if we take the Quran as our source of guidance, before we talk about any revival, any revival, we have to understand and ask ourselves the tough question, what is my relationship with the Quran? What is my relationship with the Quran? And I say this in you know almost most lectures on college campuses, by now every one of us should have a copy of the Quran that's ours, that's ours. We make uh, comments in the margins, if you will, posted notes, if you will, underlining things, if you will. Somehow that's yours, like you truly make it yours. 
And when you buy books on Amazon, it says, like, really used, worn, right, edges. That's a book, hopefully, that's not been abused, but that's been really used. And so if you don't have such a Qur'an of your own, a musallah or sajada or janimas of your own, this is your property. If everything else was to go, these two things would be something you could hold on to. And the Qur'an, as Allah says, He created us in the best of worlds. This is the Qur'an, it tells us then how to live out that life after having been created in that best of worlds. And Ibn Masood, uh, uh, who came out of the shadow of the Prophet ﷺ, meaning all of these ibadullah, Abdullah ibn Masood, Abdullah ibn Umar, Abdullah ibn Abbas, Fatima radiallahu anha, Aisha radiallahu anha, all of them grew up literally at the footsteps of the Prophet ﷺ. And he said this, uh, uh, that they, the people to come, will recite the Qur'an, but it will not go beyond their throats. Uh, and, and subhanAllah, it will uh, it'll only be beneficial when it reaches their hearts and is firmly planted in it. That it will not go beyond their throats, that it will only be beneficial when it reaches their hearts and is firmly planted in it. So revival, the source of revival, cannot be anything in its essence other than the Qur'an and the guidance that was brought to us by the Prophet wasallam. so that there's no mistake about where I'm going and what I'm going to be referring to. The context in which we're speaking is that our entire world view is predicated on learning, applying Islamic teachings. That we learn, we internalize, and then we apply that which we learn. And that the MSA, the Muslim Students Association, despite all of the jokes we make about it, the Marriage Mary Student Association, whatever you want to call it, it is ultimately a place where there should be, the ideal experience should be one of where you achieve balance, where you learn when Allah Subhanahu wa says, وَقَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطَى لِتَكُونُ شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ وَيَكُونُ رَسُولُ عَلَيْكُمْ شَحِيدًا That Allah Subhanahu wa says that we have created you indeed as a balanced nation, as a balanced nation, that if to achieve that balance, it should begin perhaps in the earlier middle school, high school years, but for sure by the MSA years. In it, you also learn, inshallah, about time management. In it, you learn at the helm of different positions of leadership. Leadership is a burden in Islam. It is a test. It is a trust. It is not something to be boastful about, nor to be campaigning about. But we learn these things. We learn about finances and financial management. And sometimes the hanging bill of the pizza bill that's unpaid from all of what we ate. And where do we find the money now? Hey, if we make them bounce balls, maybe a business will donate and we'll get the money back. You learn troubleshooting, you learn, learn to be creative. You learn about gender relations. There's absolutely nothing in Islam that forbids the two genders to interact, but there are clear guidelines of modesty and respect and of maintaining dignity. You learn, and Brother uh, Dingus Mazu said that he works on video and editing. You learn all of that. You learn creative uh, um, media uh, skills, if you will. You learn interpersonal skills and ultimately in this experience, you learn drama. And what is drama? And MSA drama is like no other drama. And subhanAllah, and I'm of Hyderabadi descent, and I thought we had drama. And then I married an Egyptian, and, I, and now I know what is drama. So together, <laughs> together we have Egyptian Hyderabadi drama, and it's like a mixture, and Allah help us between biryani and mulakhaya, what's, what's going to happen. Brothers, biryani is a dish that no one is laughing over here. <laughs> they got the food joke, sorry. Um, uh, so the academic environment helps us to really acquire knowledge, analytic, analytical skills, oral communication skills, written skills. And as a professor now, it's hard for me to watch your generation. I'll be very frank. Your generation, if we don't protect it, we don't protect the skills of articulate oral communication in complete sentences and writing, beautiful writing, not just texting and, and tweeting. These are not going to be given any Nobel Prizes anytime soon. Unless like you give the text that says the bomb is falling or something and then you get the Peace Prize. But most likely you're going to have to write complete sentences. And our generation, your generation, will have to acquire that because this the Prophet did not compromise on. He himself was tested 
with being pre-literate. We don't call them an illiterate. This is demeaning to call the Prophet the Prophet of Islam as somebody illiterate. We say he was pre-literate. Pre-literate. But he, subhanAllah, in the Battle of Badr, actually made it a requirement for those prisoners of war. So when these ignorant people, experts of Islam, Orientalists talk about our religion, and they tell us what we did with our prisoners of war, tell them that this was one, you know, one of the ways the mercy of the Prophet emanated. He made it a condition of freedom from the prisoners, for the prisoners of war if each of them who was literate could teach reading and writing to at least 10 of our Muslims. Think about the power of that, right? So we value reading, we value writing, we value communication, and you're learning all of these things, and we ultimately want you to do them well. We want you to do everything well, because these are preludes. These are, we don't live our lives in compartments. We don't say, I will attempt to achieve spiritual excellence and leave behind everything else, do it in a shoddy manner, half-hearted, mediocrity reigns in the community, and we can no longer have that. If your undergraduate and graduate experience were mostly mediocre, then there's still hope. Still you can turn things around, because this ummah in this century, and I'm convinced Allah sent us enough signs, the 21st century is the century of Islam. I don't say that in a boastful way, I don't say that in a proud way, because we have not yet proved ourselves worthy of that test and that trust, but Allah has given us enough signs that this is our century for us to truly begin to practice our religion and to explain it on our terms. But there are challenges of the nafsi desires, the lower desires, which will distract us from excellence, which will distract us from being those who uphold the obligatory uh, action, acts of worship, and for sure, stay away from the nawafil and the voluntary. There are those uh, uh, moments that we'll never be able to win back, that we spent in amusement. We spent too much time. I mean, sometimes these games go into overtime, and it's two to three to four hours of some of our best minds sitting in front of a, 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 a TV, or, 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 or where, however you're watching it, and, or even if you're watching it live. And that potential, imagine, multiply that potential. Multiply it and see what is the loss on the, the Muslim Ummah, so that you don't see more people breaking their backs, only a few people doing a lot of work for the community, and everybody else being consumers of the work, and benefiting from this tremendous health, and, and physical and financial sacrifices, and emotional sacrifices of those few people. There will be the notion of self first, me first, and this is something of a disease. That if we do that, if we live through college like that, we will never achieve any form of excellence if it's always about me and never about anyone else. There's a limit to how much I can care for myself. My body has a right over me. This is a reminder of the Prophet ﷺ. But it doesn't mean that I can all, cannot look and see and be concerned about others. So as we take these things into our professional lives, the transition from college to, uh, to uh, uh, the, the career, we realize that there is a major investment being made into our upbringing by our parents. We realize a major investment of money, of time, of emotion, all of these things. And we must ultimately, we cannot take for granted that their sacrifices. And therefore, there's absolutely no justification to separate academic life from the religious and spiritual life. Absolutely no justification. If somebody is doing this, this is something that they have written for themselves. This is not from our religion. They cannot be. For everything you learn, for everything you learn, subhanAllah, you must do it with ihsan, with excellence. And if you can, especially take seriously and transform your learning so that it is done through the lens of Islam, then you can convert every research paper, every assignment, everything you are being asked to do into something that connects you back to your religion so that you can become an ambassador of the faith and help others to truly understand at the formative years in college what it is that you stand for, what it is that you believe in. Write about that which moves you. I tell my students all the time, I have absolutely no need for you to write as if like someone forced you to write. Write about something that moves you and then do it well. Do it well, research it well. Find the primary sources, don't rely on the secondary sources, even for Islamic learning. Google and Wikipedia, and these things are tools to begin the initial search if you have absolutely nowhere to turn. But there are enough institutes, there are enough 
uh, uh, scholars now. There are enough people around that can help us to get that. And so therefore, all of that context tells us that these are prerequisites to achieving and attempting uh, to achieve spiritual uh, excellence. There are, let us be clear about this, there are serious, serious human problems. Human problems. I don't say Muslim problems. Human problems. That every single one of us has the potential to help to solve or resolve. To solve or to resolve. Whether it's the simple thing for us of having a bottle of water half unfinished. Sometimes I walk around our home and find like maybe eight or ten of these at any different part of the house. And then I look at my children and I ask them, do you see this? This small, maybe this much of water, clean water, others in the world would die for because of the waterborne diseases that end up destroying, destroying them internally and potentially affect them for life. There are serious human problems in the realm of healthcare, in the realm of in the environment and the climate. And brother, I see Brother Faraz has joined us. Is this still Brother Faraz? He looks very young today, mashallah. <laughs> right? uh, the environment and the climate, right? The consumption, the disease of consumption, right? These are serious human problems. The things that we are consuming that others have made overseas. Look to see where they were made and look to see what we are doing. If we are consumers but not contributors to the betterment of society, people will just look upon us as that, as just nothing but consumers. And lastly, in the context, achieving this perfection in our, in our college and career, we must strive for halal, permissible sources of income. Let there be nobody in the 21st century who says, I have to do this because I have no other choice. Lest that be a source for them to seek the displeasure of Allah and not the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so that a job should not be just about paying bills, rather, for sisters and for brothers, we should be intentional about our career choice. And I say nothing that I myself have not put myself to a test, and then I encourage my brothers and sisters, and that's why when Brother Ibad introduced me, he wasn't misreading something, it clearly was that I, I have a bachelor's in biomedical engineering with control and systems focus, and then I gave that to my parents. I said, I think you wanted this. <laughs> I said, I think you wanted this. Because my dad wanted a medical, uh, uh, I think an engineer, sorry, and my mother wanted a doctor. So I was the dutiful son, and I did biomedical <laughs> engineering. I thought, this could make them happy, right? This could really do it. And then I thought, subhanAllah, every time I was walking around, people would be like, you know, we, we engineers don't talk a lot about feelings, and you keep asking about how we're feeling. Right? Maybe this is not for you. Right? Because we don't talk about feelings, we just make things. Right? Produce things. You can make an artificial heart, but we don't talk about the heart, right? <laughs> so I thought about that. Was, oh, that's a signal for me. It's a sign for me. So I was a resident assistant. I counsel people, you know, at the, at the lay level, in the in the dorms, right? In the in the residence halls. I I, 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 I did everything in that. And then I thought, you know, this is how Allah is guiding me. It was a critical choice, painful choice, you know, not an easy choice. It took a lot of road trips between Michigan and Arbor, Michigan, where my sister lived, and Cleveland, where we lived and where nobody can walk out of the car at 70 miles an hour and go, I'm leaving, <laughs> right? You can. So you have to kind of work it out over two or three hours and you keep working it out. And ultimately my parents understood that this was a conviction. I wasn't taking an easy way out. I wasn't thinking, saying that I couldn't do well because I, I, I did well, but it was a conviction. So your the idea must be now to choose a career, whatever it is, and you must do it well. These are times when you cannot afford people being unhappy or unsatisfied or even worse, to be mediocre in their careers. Why? Because when people look to see who to promote, who to appoint the head of a subcommittee or a task force, we want, not for pride or vanity, we want them to say, choose the Muslim. For when you think about ethical behavior, the Muslim stands out. When you think about excellence, the Muslim stands out. When you think about ingenuity and creativity, the Muslim stands out. And we want to stand out. We don't want to stand out for the negative things that the media tells, uh, talks about. We want to stand out for the excellence that our Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa taught us. And lastly, on the context, if Islam is indeed to be a transformative force in our lives, it must be reflected in our performance throughout. Throughout college, everything. And in fact, if every association, uh, if every Muslim student association aspired to that excellence, then we would have events not for the sake of events, because that tires out people, it wears out their best energies, but we would have events that are functional and that advance a cohesive agenda 
and objectives for that year. When we have that in our minds, we will inshallah ta'ala do our best to have that when we go to our careers and in everything else. Spiritual excellence. Allah SWT says in the Quran, O mankind, what has made you careless? Ya ayyuhal insan, ma gharraka bi rabbikal kareem. O mankind, why have you become careless essentially in, in, in your approach to your Lord? In your approach to your Lord. And if you look at the condition of the Muslims today, if you think about this today, Shaykh Abdullah Idris Ali was, I'm not picking on it, this was a story that he gave us, so it's just, a, it's just, it happened. This is how it happened, and this was the country he was in. It could be any country, I suppose. This was the 50th anniversary of the student wing of Jamaat Islami in Pakistan, and he was there. He had there invited him. And he said, SubhanAllah, as he heard the Adhan, from being in America, he rushed to prayer because that's what we do, because we're somehow on a hyper mode to do what we need to do for Allah. But he saw nobody else moving, or not many people moving. And this could be any country. It could be Tunisia, Morocco, all of North Africa. It could be India, anywhere. Egypt, wherever you're from. If I've left you out, this is not the time to say, he left out my country, because I'm talking about negative things, right? <laughs> so this is not the time to have Asabiya, um, which is tribalism. So the, the idea was what? That the carelessness did not just happen overnight. It did not just happen overnight. It happened with one or two or three people falling victim to the content, contented feelings that we get from thinking we've arrived, that thinking we've achieved, thinking I've gotten it. So whatever my dream is, I think I've made it. And therefore, I will just stop now. And ultimately, the first thing to go in that order is always the, the dhikr of, and the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is phenomenal because this is the ghafla. This is the state of forgetful, forgetfulness that shaitan brings to us. And in, 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 that, and in that, I say, I, my reminder to myself and to you is, even if we've done that, even if we've done that, know that our Lord is merciful. He sent a prophet, uh, Allah's place and blessing be upon him, who himself was mercy manifested on earth, so that we, he says about him, that Allah SWT has written upon himself mercy. In another tradition we know that Allah SWT created mercy in a hundred parts, and he only he kept 99 parts with him and sent one part to earth. And the Prophet said, because of that one part, because of that one part, the animal lifts its hoof so that it does not hurt its own, its rear hoof, so it does not hurt its own offspring. Think about that. Think about Rahmah manifest. So if we're not doing well with Allah, don't give up and say, I'm just, I'm just so messed up. I'm not. No, bring back, come back. Encourage others to come back. Right? Make dua for them. And it was, it was another tradition of the Prophet that said that basically if a believer invokes Allah, makes dua for the absent brother or sister, the angels say, Ameen. The angels say, Ameen to that dua. And then they say, for you the same. Allah. This is the power of dua. So let us have hope. Let us always have hope. And let us, inshallah, try to, to, to strive for the best. So how do we achieve that? Well, the companions in the beginning weren't sure what to make of the Qur'an that was being revealed. And then here was the Prophet And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala heard their anxiety, if you will. And a verse in Surah Ali Imran was revealed that said, قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ Say that if you love Allah, then the, this is the Messenger of Allah speaking to them, follow me, فَاتَّبِعُونِ If you love Allah, if you say you love Allah, then follow me. For why? Ultimately, in modern terms, I am to you the user manual for that which is described in the Quran as the principles and the higher level ideals and the objectives of life. This was the example of the Prophet So how well in the month of Rabi al-Awwal are we following his guidance? We get stuck in this, his birth, celebrate, not celebrate. And we forget the message that he brought, the message that he brought. To betray his message, to betray his message would be to act in a manner displeasing not only, not only misaligned with his message, but also displeasing to Allah, as did the people after the cartoon crisis. The cartoons that were drawn, of course, we deplore that. Of course, we are offended, we are hurt. But to go and loot businesses, to hurt others, and to indeed have a few people die in the middle of that ruckus, to me, 
offends the sensibility of the message that the Prophet ﷺ does and removes us from the path to any form of revival for no revival can occur when we trample on the very teachings that he ﷺ brought for us and indeed that's a reminder to myself and to you. So how to achieve that spiritual excellence and I'm abbreviating a little bit. In the Hadith Qudsi narrated in Sahih al-Bukhari as uh, give, uh, uh, told to us by Abu Huraira Allah SWT says ما زال عبدي يتقرب إلي بالنوافل that my servant does not stop approaching me does not stop drawing near to me with nawafil, with voluntary acts until I love him in the universal sense I love him or her when I love him, not if, فإذا not, not if, but when I love him I become the hearing with which he hears the sight with which he sees the hands with which he acts, the legs with which he walks. Think about it. Sometimes we get abstract. Say, you know, I don't know what's really happening with all this voluntary stuff. And you see these uncles praying like, you know, extra sunnahs and doing all this. And we're like in a rush to go on to life. Why do you think they're doing that? There's a habit that they've ingrained in themselves. And hopefully we can benefit from that habit for ourselves. The Monday and Thursday fasts. The Monday and Thursday fasts. These are acts of nawafil, voluntary acts. These, Allah SWT is saying, when you keep doing this, so I mean, so think about this, we say to each other, well, you know, I'm getting married, uh, you know, this is when people perk up, like, what, marriage? Just talk about marriage, right? I'm getting married, I want to practicing Muslim. Do you ever think about why do we use the word practice? Where did that come from? It's not in Islam. It's not a word that's known. In fact, in the Urdu, you don't even say practicing Muslim, you say panchwat namazi, right? <laughs> right? Isn't that true? They go, I was really, I came to like an airport one time, I was going to rent a car, the guy, I think he was like a young Pakistani or Indian guy, Muslim. He goes, you know, we started to chit chat and he goes, he goes, so where are you from? I said, yeah, I'm originally from India, but I've been raised here. He looked at me and he goes, with, you know, you look like you just got here. Because, <laughs> you know, the, he thought you shaved the beard at JFK and you just sort of come in looking like American. And I said, he said, with that beard, you look like a panchvak namazi. <laughs> So what was I supposed to say? With the clean shave, you look like a no-walk <laughs> I don't know what that means. How do we associate outward looks? This is not Islam. This is not Islam. Because outwardly, I may have a beard, but I may be the worst Muslim. I may wear a hijab, but I may have no haya. Haya, modesty comes from that. It's together. Both of these together. So let us not fall. So this hadith is very important. Hadith Qudsi. So give, let me give you an example as I close. Uh, Ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma tells us that his father, uh, Abdullah, I mean, his father, Umar al-Makhattab, Amir al-Mu'mineen, Abu Hafs, when he was in charge of, he was the Khalifa, he sent out an army. He appointed Sariya as the commander of that army. And one day as uh, Umar al-Makhattab was giving the khutbah, in the middle of the khutbah, like I'm giving a, a, a talk now, I have a train of thought, and if I suddenly say something strange, to you, you'll be like, wait, what happened to him? He did that. In the middle of his khutbah, he stopped and he said, O oh, Sariya al-Jabal, O Sariya al-Jabal, O Sariya al-Jabal. And he, people were like, what is going on? After the khutbah, they asked him, why did you say that? He said, if the Muslim army moves the, its back towards the mountain, it will only have to fight the enemy from one side. You follow me? If the mountain protects it. But they're thinking, dude, we don't have text messaging, we don't have tweeting. They're like hundreds of miles away. What are you talking about? A few weeks later, a courier comes. A courier comes back to the commander and says, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, we were on the verge of being defeated. When suddenly we heard a loud voice warning us by the name of our commander, O Sariya, the mountain, O Sariya, the mountain, O Sariya, the mountain. We moved our army, we moved our back to the mountain, and Allah defeated our opponents. Can you think about that? Do you understand that Umar al Khattab had in his face this was a man who was on the verge of wanting to assassinate the Prophet because of the way of life that he was ruling for them, right? When he became a Muslim, he had, after, after being in Islam for many years, he had ridges on his face. You know from how? From the tears he shed. Have you ever thought about crying that much? That it would actually create a flow for your tears inside, ingrained into your cheeks? In my cheek, can you think about that? Have we ever cried about anything, anything, material perhaps, but anything in the akhirah sense that we would be in that, in that realm? So he was open to receive the message of Allah 
He was open for this hadith to say when Allah says, مَا زَالَ عَبْدِي يَتَقَرَّبَ إِلَيَّ بِالنَّوَافِلِ That my servant does not stop drawing near to me until I love him. When I love him, he becomes the hearing with which he hears, the sight with which he sees. Imagine the commander on the other side is not a worldly commander. His troops, we know the history of the troops. They were not engaged in all this debauchery before battles. They were protecting and defending the word of Allah. They were engaged standing in the nights in prayer, praying for a solution, praying for peace, praying for the best ability to, to, to wage that war in the best of humanity, not in the worst of humanity as is going on today. Think about that. And so he, he's receptive to the message and the one is able to speak the message and it's able to be carried through now what we know has been proven as a possibility of satellite and uh, uh, communication that is not in immediate face-to-face -face contact. Think about that. And that's just one example inshallah as I close. So, and I'll say the rest of this, I, I don't want to delay but Maghrib, I have a few more minutes. But, but basically think about this, right? The spiritual uh, excellence, the path to spiritual excellence into revival, oftentimes what happens is, and you know this, as people become more and more practicing, and by the way, the word practicing means what? Marathon athletes, when they're running a marathon, 10K marathon, they do what before the marathon? They practice. practice. So when we say practice, if we're going to use that term, we're talking about doing so much of it and so good and being so good at it in Islam that we're actually preparing for the akhirah, for the day of judgment on the day when there will be no shade but the shade of Allah subhanahu now do you understand practice? That's what we mean by practice, not the physical look of, you know, outside, outward look. It's every bone in our body. And part of that spiritual excellence is achieving high character, excellent character. Because those two things somehow, in the last 20, 30, 40 years, especially in the minority countries where we're not, as Muslims in number, numerical minority, it seems like becoming closer to Allah, somehow got associated with becoming harsher to our brothers and sisters. You following me? This is not our religion. This is not the example of the Prophet This was not the case of his companions. May Allah, uh, may Allah be pleased with all of them. And in that, in that, there is love for one's brother and sister. In that, the Prophet told us, as narrated by Anas ibn Malik, in, in the Arba'in of Imam al-Nawawi, that, and you know this, that none of you truly believes until you love for your brother, sister, what you love for yourself. Think about this. And Imam Abi Zayd al-Qairawani, who wrote the Risala in Maliki Fiqh, actually says that this hadith about none of you truly believes until you love for your brother, sister, what you love for yourself, complete is the summation of good adab, of good manners, of good akhlaq. The other reminders from the Prophet ﷺ, he says being, speak little, speak little, mind your own business, do not become angry, that does that. And then this last one, ultimately love for your brother or sister what you love for yourself. And when we say, la yu'minu ahadakum, the ijma of the scholars is, this is not a, a distinction between iman and kufr, because some people may think that. No, this is about the completion or the strengthening of faith. You follow me? It's about getting stronger in our faith by loving for our brother or sister. And that was what I mentioned about saying, uh, about Itha when I, when I first started. So this character has to be strong, man. People have to benefit from our existence. Ultimately, we are three feet, I don't know, with the new conditions, five feet wide or maybe eight feet tall, I don't know, whatever we're going to be. That's all we are. And when we lay in the ground, that's all we'll be. So what did we do while we were alive? How did we benefit others with our existence? Were we of benefit to anybody else except for our own consumption and the satisfaction of our lower desires? For Imam al-Ghazali, in his treatise, Ya Ayyuh al walad it is actually different. He says the peak of good adab, the peak of good adab, he says that I, and he says you, but I will make, I don't like to ever say you, that, and I'm transforming, paraphrasing it, so bear with me, that he says, I burden myself with the pleasure of others and I do not burden others with my pleasures. Are you following me? Except if they violate the Sharia. Right? That I, bur I don't burden others with my pleasures, but I burden myself with their pleasures. Can you imagine if every Muslim businessman, 
If every Muslim doctor, lawyer, engineer, social worker, teacher, principal, whatever it is you're doing, working in da'wah, relief, whatever you're doing, if everybody sought to be excellent in what they're doing, and if everybody sought to practice ihsan and ifar, would our condition be as it is today? Would people be able to trample over our community, defile the Qur'an, defile the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ because of the state that we're in? This is happening. But if we improve, if we make a commitment to improve, indeed, ultimately, inshallah ta'ala, Allah SWT will not only elevate us in the ranks and degrees, but the product of that together, of that uh, collective excellence, will in itself elevate all of humanity to a newer ranks. To newer ranks. Why? Because they will then look and see those 1.5 billion Muslims, they are not a burden to us. They are not a burden to us. For when they have something, they think of others who don't have. Before they want something, they think of others who don't have. Before they strive to achieve more, they look to see how much they've achieved and have they done it well. Have they done it in an excellent manner. Spiritual revival, spiritual excellence, brothers and sisters, cannot come at the expense of mediocrity in college. Mediocrity in, in the career. For we have nothing to gain by having people, you wouldn't want that. You wouldn't want that. And I believe me, I say this, but I mean it as a form of encouragement. I have more anxiety going to Muslim mechanics because of the experiences that we've had than I have to just going to a random mechanic and saying, here's our car, do it. Because at least there, I will hopefully have a contractual relationship where I can take them to court. But with the Muslims, sometimes he's like, no brother, we'll take care of it, go ahead. How much will it be? No, no, Allah, you know, inshallah, everything will be okay. <laughs> Actually, I have to know because I, maybe I can't afford it. You don't have prices on your menus. I don't even know how much I, I can afford to eat. No, no, brother, inshallah, just eat, everything will be okay. <laughs> the bill comes and the naan was like $5, dude. You don't even make the naan, right? <laughs> People from other countries, I won't say which, are making the naan. In Virginia area, they make it a karahi too, it's really good, right? They're from like South America, right? You want to be the best, you don't want to use the cheapest oils in every Muslim. We have a homeopathy doctor who says if you want to get sick, go to you know, like an Indo-Pakistani restaurant. Because the oil is cheap, why are we doing that? Why are we killing our own people with processed sugar? With excellence means, I will give you the best product, why? Because I want you to be a content customer, but I want you to get fair price for what you pay. I don't want to cheat you. I don't want to hold back ingredients. I don't want to keep back portions. I want to be the best in everything I do. So if there is somebody that aspires to be an auto mechanic, be the best auto mechanic and let people line up to come to your shop, even if they have to be on a waiting list. Why? Because they will know. They will know that when I took a masjid van as a volunteer to the, uh, to the garage, and I told them, this is what's wrong. The masjid told me to bring it here so that you can fix it. When I came back to pick it up, they said, well, we also fix this, and we also fix this, and this is your bill. I said, they didn't need fixing. We didn't know about it. Did you talk to us? No, no, brother, you know, it needed fixing. You feel a punch in your stomach. You feel like, why? How can you be taken by a fellow Muslim? But this can't happen in the religion of Islam. But it is happening because you and I allow it. Those business people, the doctors, the lawyers, the business, anybody who is not on the path of excellence, when we can go back to them, we're allowing them to be continuing in mediocrity. Let us challenge them and say, we want to support you until you elevate your service, the quality of your service. Why? Because as a Muslim, you deserve to do so. And if others follow that, that is enough da'wah, enough excellence for everyone to learn from. I'll stop there, inshallah, by reminding myself and, and my brothers and sisters that indeed, every moment of our, of, our, uh, uh, of our existence right now is, uh, is, is, you know, is, is written. Allah SWT knows where it is that we're going to die, when we're going to die. But this is not a reason to stop living. That we live so that we fulfill every one of His commandments to the best of our abilities, infusing every moment of our lives with adhkar. If you commute, I say to you, don't treat the commute as a curse, treat it as a blessing that you are in the khalwa with Allah alone. Don't turn on the radio at the top of the hour, turn it on for a few minutes to hear headlines in case something, something terrible has happened or some weather change or whatever, but go back to adhkar. Go back to adhkar because this is how we're losing it. We're getting distracted, even sometimes, and I, I don't mind, we should listen to lectures and everything, but sometimes you get caught up in so much of that that we ourselves don't seek istighfar. 
That we ourselves don't say Astaghfirullah and say, Oh Allah, I have made some I have had some problems, I need some help, and indeed I, I want you to forgive me. And indeed we know, we know that Allah SWT is all forgiving, most merciful, He waits for us to come back. And so the beginning of any path to revival will be to achieve, to, uh, and achieving spiritual excellence will be to begin to be the best in the college, in the, on the college campuses, in our academic life, in the MSA life, in our careers, but then infuse all aspects of that with Islam, and subhanAllah, those two things, when they come together, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Now we're witnessing the fruits of the labor of so many people who invested uh, uh, time and energy in helping young boys and girls become hafid of the Qur'an. Some of them have gone on to become medical doctors. They are hafid of the Qur'an. In this, in America. In America, when 20 years ago the covers of some Islamic organizations, the magazine said, will the community survive? Not only did it survive, by the mercy of Allah, we have thrived. We have tried, but we cannot be content with that. We have to strive for higher and higher degrees, not only among ourselves, but to encourage each, uh, not only encourage each other, but encourage our families, indeed our entire communities. I will close with that, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan. Salaamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa Oh, that's my turn, yeah, for